Uh, we're going to start tonight, actually, with some breaking news. Uh, the New York Times is reporting tonight that President Obama has chosen a new director for the FBI. And if the New York Times on this, uh, if their reporting on this is correct, this choice is going to be a very big, hairy political deal. The FBI became the FBI in 1935. In all of those years that has existed, in all of that time, you want to know how many people have had the job of running the FBI? Six. Six guys in total have ever had the job of running that agency in nearly 80 years. We've had lots and lots and lots more presidents than that since then, but only six FBI directors. And that is mostly because J. Edgar Hoover was in charge of the FBI for almost 50 of those years. After J. Edgar Hoover was there for half a century, the Congress decided in its wisdom that maybe FBI directors should have term limits. So they are term limited to 10 years. 10 years. 10 years. It's still a really long time, right? In our government, nobody has a 10-year term. It's a really long time for anybody to be in office. And even with that incredibly and unusually long term that FBI directors can stay in office now, for the current director of the FBI, Congress decided that they were going to stretch it even further than 10 years for him. Robert Mueller was appointed to run the FBI by President George W. Bush in 2001. Bob Mueller took office exactly one week before 9-11 happened. But he was appointed in 2001, so the end of his 10-year term came up in 2011. And that should have been it for him. But the Obama administration and the Senate decided that they would keep Bob Mueller on at the FBI for another couple of years anyway. Most of the reporting at the time said it was essentially because the head of the CIA was leaving at the time and the head of the Pentagon was leaving at the time. And it was thought that the FBI and the CIA and the military all transitioning to brand new leadership all at the exact same time might be a dangerous national security situation for the country. So there ended up being a unanimous vote in the Senate to give Bob Mueller another couple of years after his 10 years was up. But that is even up now. And it is time for a new director of the FBI. There's been a lot of speculation on who it might be. Today, in a surprise move, the New York Times is reporting that President Obama has picked to run the FBI the guy who was at the middle of the bizarre late-night hospital room drama that led the guy who's currently running the FBI to threaten to quit his job in protest when it happened. This was one of the weirdest and most dramatic stories that was ever told about something that happened inside the Bush administration. It was March 2004. The Attorney General was John Ashcroft. And as Attorney General, John Ashcroft was being asked to sign off on on some Bush administration surveillance program. He was supposed to sign off as to whether or not he thought that program was legal. And he thought that program was not legal. And so he was not going to sign off on it. And that led to the late night car chase, hospital room, swearing standoff that was one of the most dramatic things ever described in a congressional hearing on tape ever. And this is the guy now. Watch. This was a uh, very memorable uh, period in my life, probably the most difficult time in my entire professional life. And that night was probably the most difficult night of my professional life. So it's not something I forget. Okay. Were you present when Alberto Gonzalez visited Attorney General Ashcroft's bedside? Yes. And am I correct that the conduct of Mr. Gonzalez and Mr. Card on that evening troubled you greatly? Yes. Okay. Let me go back and take it from the top. You rushed to the hospital that evening. Why? I'm only hesitating because I need to explain why. Please. I give you all the time you need, sir. I've I've, uh, actually thought quite a bit over the last three years about how I would answer that question if it was ever asked, because I assumed that at some point I would have to testify about it. James Comey, then at this point in the hearing, explains that he will not explain what this classified program is um, that caused this standoff in the hospital room that he's about to describe. He says he will not describe the classified program itself because he's in an open hearing. And he will not say what his legal advice was as a deputy attorney, as a deputy attorney general. But nevertheless, even though he won't describe those two things, he is going to tell the Senate and tell the country the story of what happened on that insane night. Listen. 
remember the precise date, the, the program had to be renewed by March the 11th, which was a Thursday of 2004. And we were engaged in a very intensive reevaluation of the matter. And a week before that March 11th deadline, I had a private meeting with the Attorney General for an hour, just the two of us, and I laid out for him what we had learned and what our analysis was of this particular matter. And uh, at the end of that hour-long private session, he and I agreed on a course of action. And within hours, he was stricken and taken very, very ill. You thought, just some, you thought something was wrong with how it was being operated or administered or overseen? We had, yes, we had concerns as to our ability to certify its legality, and which was our obligation for the program to be renewed. The Attorney General was taken that very afternoon to George Washington Hospital, where he went into intensive care and remained there for over a week, and I became the Acting Attorney General. And over the next week, particularly the following week on Tuesday, we communicated to the relevant parties at the White House and, and elsewhere our decision that, as Acting Attorney General, I would not certify the program as to its legality and explained our reasoning in detail, which I will not go into here, nor am I confirming it's any particular program. That was Tuesday that we communicated that. The next day was Wednesday, March the 10th, the night of the hospital incident, and I was headed home at about 8 o'clock that evening. My security detail was driving me. And I remember exactly where I was on Constitution Avenue and got a call from Attorney General Ashcroft's chief of staff telling me that he had gotten What's a call. his name? David Ayers. That he had gotten a call from Mrs. Ashcroft from the hospital. She had banned all visitors and all phone calls. So I hadn't seen him or talked to him because he was very ill. And Mrs. Ashcroft reported that a call had come through and that as a result of that call, Mr. Card and Mr. Gonzalez were on their way to the hospital to see Mr. Ashcroft. Do you have any idea who that call was from? I have some recollection that the call was from the President himself, but I don't know that for sure. It came from the White House, and it came through, and uh, the call was taken in the hospital. So I hung up the phone, immediately called my Chief of Staff, uh, told him to get as many of my people as possible to the hospital immediately. I hung up, called Director Muller, and with whom I'd been discussing this particular matter, and who'd been a great help to me over that week, and told him what was happening. He said, I'll meet you at the hospital right now. Told my security detail that I need to get to George Washington Hospital immediately. They turned on the emergency equipment and drove very quickly to the hospital. I got out of the car and ran up, literally ran up the stairs with my security detail. What was your concern? You were in, obviously, a huge hurry. I was concerned that, given how ill I knew the Attorney General was, that there might be an effort to ask him to overrule me when he was in no condition to do that. Right. Okay. I, I was worried about him, frankly. And so I raced to the hospital room, uh, entered, and... Uh, Mrs. Ashcroft was standing by the hospital bed. Uh, Mr. Ashcroft was lying down in the bed. The room was darkened. And I immediately began speaking to him, trying to orient him as to time and place, and try to see if he could focus on what was happening. And it wasn't clear to me that he could. He seemed pretty bad off. And, and at that point, it was you, Mrs. Ashcroft, and the Attorney General and maybe medical personnel in the room. No other Justice Department or just the government three of officials. Us. Just the three of us at that point. Uh, I tried to see if I could help him get oriented. As I said, it wasn't clear that I had succeeded. I went out in the hallway, spoke to Director Muller by phone. He was on his way. Um, he, I handed the phone to the head of the security detail, and Director Muller instructed the FBI agents present not to allow me to be removed from the room under any circumstances. And I went back in the room. I was shortly joined by the head of the Office of Legal Counsel, Assistant Attorney General Jack Goldsmith, and a senior staffer of mine who had worked on this matter, and Associate Deputy Attorney General. So the three of us, Justice Department people, went in the room. I sat down. Can you just give us the names of the two other people? It's Jack Goldsmith, who was the Assistant Attorney General, and Patrick Philbin, who was Associate Deputy Attorney General. I sat down in an armchair by the head of the Attorney General's bed. The two other Justice Department people stood behind me, and Mrs. Ashcroft stood by the bed holding her husband's arm, and we waited. 
and it was only a matter of minutes that the door opened and in walked uh, Mr. Gonzalez carrying an envelope and Mr. Card. They came over and stood by the bed, greeted the Attorney General very briefly, and then Mr. Gonzalez began to discuss why they were there, to seek his approval for a matter, and explain what the matter was, which I will not do. And um, Attorney General Ashcroft then stunned me. Uh, he lifted his head off the pillow and in very strong terms expressed his view of the matter, rich in both substance and fact, which stunned me, drawn from the hour-long meeting we'd had a week earlier, and in very strong terms expressed himself, and then uh, laid his head back down on the pillow, uh, seemed spent, and said to them, but that doesn't matter because I'm not the Attorney General. But he expressed his reluctance, or his, he would not sign the statement that they give give the authorization that they had asked. Is that right? Yes. And as he laid back down, he said, "But that doesn't matter because I'm not the attorney general. There is the attorney general." And he pointed to me when I was just to his left. Uh, the two men did not acknowledge me. They turned and walked from the room. And then they tried to say that the program was approved even without the Attorney General signing off on it. Do you believe that happened? And James Comey, the man he just saw testifying there, wrote his letter of resignation. He was the counterterrorism guy, essentially, in the Justice Department. He'd been a counterterrorism prosecutor. That day that he wrote the letter of, the resi his re letter of resignation was the day of the Madrid bombings. He wanted to resign anyway. He wrote his letter of resignation and prepared it if the White House was going to go through with this. And the FBI director at the time, Robert Mueller, said that he, too, would resign if the White House was going to go through with this. And there was a threat that there were going to be mass resignations at the top levels of the Justice Department if the White House went through with this, in protest of the Bush White House acting in a way that its own attorney general said was illegal. But these guys stopped it, in part with a car chase and that standoff in the hospital room. And now today, James Comey, six foot eight former terrorism prosecutor, deputy attorney general under John Ashcroft, the man who sat in an armchair at the head of the bed in that hospital room where John Ashcroft was laying there sick with acute pancreatitis and everybody thought he couldn't even speak, the guy who sat there and said to the White House, no, you cannot do this, it is illegal, I will stop it. Tonight, the New York Times has just reported that President Obama is about to pick him to run the FBI. Anybody else looking forward to that confirmation hearing? We'll be right back.